a comodo uno. Good morning. I'm honored to be with you today, and I congratulate you as well on your 15th anniversary. I'll give you all time to put on your headsets. Um, I, I truly applaud the ambition of Russian railways, of the Russian government, because what you are doing is fulfilling a deep historical mission. What is that mission? That mission is for Russia to be a truly connected country, a state that is the main connector between the two largest economic regions of the world, Europe and Asia, and to be part, deeply part, of both of them. That is not historically the way we have thought about Russia's role in Eurasia and in the world. But I want to show you how in the 21st century that is the mandate, that is the mission for Russia. So the incredible ambition that we have already seen in the video and in the opening comments from ministers, executives, even that is not enough. Why? Let's begin with a little historical tour. Here you have every single highway and railway, every single electricity grid and oil or gas pipeline in the world, and here too, all of the world's fiber optic cables. But we now live in a world of almost nine billion people. The world population is going to grow towards 10 billion people. Connectivity never stops. Ever since mankind began wandering out of Africa and populating the continents, we have used whatever technology available, from small stones to make paths, to fiber optic internet cables. To be human is to be connected and to continue to seek to build connectivity. And Russia is the largest country in the world must advance that mission on behalf of everyone. Now, this is not how we are typically taught geography. We appreciate natural geography, the way that God gave us the Earth. We color blue for the oceans, brown for the deserts, green for the forests. That is natural geography. But the way you and I were raised and the way our children go to school, the maps that they see are political geography, the maps in the middle. Those maps show us how we are divided from one another by borders. But that is, of course, not the mission of Russian railways. That is not the mission of this forum. The mission here is to connect across borders. The mission is to advance functional geography. That is the geography of connectivity. Now, when we think about Russian history, to put it very simply, it is conquer or be conquered, expand or be invaded. That's what political geography teaches us. The 21st century is truly different. To be powerful is to be connected. Otherwise, you will be evaded. If you are not connected, other forces will simply go around you. They will ignore you. So Russian power in the future is not the power only of territory. It is the power and the influence that comes from connectivity. And Russia needs a lot more of it. And it needs to be wise, strategic, and looking at the long term about what connectivity to invest in, transportation, energy, communications, with which neighbors, who owns the assets, who benefits from all of the industries that will develop logistics to services on top of those infrastructures. That is how one becomes powerful in the 21st century. So it is not the traditional way of thinking about the role of Russia, but it is the present and it is most certainly the future. 
And because of the technologies that we have today, these are very durable infrastructures. I love this quote from the great Spanish architect, Santiago Calatrava. He says, what we build today will last for centuries. Today, there are parts of the world where countries are collapsing. But actually, some of the pipelines and the railways that were built before those countries were born are still there. So today you are investing in the infrastructures that transcend the borders of yesterday. You are building a very different kind of future, a connected future, a world where the lines across borders actually matter more than the borders. The second great mega trend of history, besides connectivity through infrastructure is urbanization. To be human is to want to be connected. To be human is also to want to be with other people. And the majority of the world population today now lives in cities. This is a heat map, a demographic heat map. Every human being in the world is a pixel on this map. That means all of you and me. And you can see the distribution of humanity around the world. Yellow are, are the most dense areas. Purple and black are the least dense. And you can also see ovals that I have drawn in. There are 48 of them. Those are the 48 largest urban clusters in the world. On a political map, the map that you might have in your office, every city is the same size little black dot. Sochi is the same size as Moscow. But that's not true in the real world. In the real world, cities have become archipelagos. They can be dozens of kilometers wide. They can have 50 or 60 million people in the larger urban area. And there are more and more and more of these mega city clusters. And those are the places where you see infrastructure investment, demographic growth, urbanization come together. Those are the cities that most want and need to be connected to all of the others. And we can predict out to the year 2030, 2035, which will be the most significant cities in the world. And so you can see very clearly, this is your roadmap. These are the cities that must be better connected to each other. And right now, it's not sufficient for the growth, for the potential, to achieve the potential. So combine the maps of connectivity with the maps of urbanization, and you see the world that is evolving. And you see the potential for your business to grow. Now, I showed you that Asia, particularly China and India, is where you have the largest concentration of populations. I think this is a very impactful way of showing that as well. More people live in that circle, which is only about one-sixth of the surface area, of the land area of the world, than live outside the circle. Now, that is true today, but let me tell you something very important. That will always be true for my lifetime, your lifetime, our children's lifetime. Because the world population will only reach about 10 billion people. And 50% or 51% or more of those people will live in that core urban, uh, in that core Asian geography. That is very, very significant because you can see that this is the region that is most proximate to Russia. And as I said at the beginning, you are the connector between the European region and this greater urban region. There are increasing flows between these regions that make it a necessity to be the connector. Let me show you from an economic standpoint what is happening. Europe represents the largest proportion of global trade. Not only 
because of trade within Europe, between European countries. But actually, Europe's trade with Asia is already, already greater than its trade with America. Now, for those of us who remember the post-war period, the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, it was the transatlantic relationship that was the foundation of the world economy. But today, Europe has turned east. Europe today trades more with Asia than with North America. And the second largest zone of trade in the world is East Asia. And the trade between Europe and East Asia is larger than each of them trade with North America. So Eurasia is economically growing together very, very rapidly. And what is so interesting is that this has happened. We have reached this state where there is $1.6 trillion of trade between Europe and Asia before there are major free trade agreements. China has not yet been granted the status of a market economy by Europe. There is only one major free trade agreement between Europe and an Asian country, and that is South Korea. They are negotiating now with Japan, with India, with Southeast Asia, and that will certainly expand that figure even more in the coming decade. What else is missing? What else will expand the trade volumes, the investment volumes, between the two ends of Eurasia? besides free trade agreements. That is what is done on paper. What's missing still is more of what is done on the ground. It's the connectivity. And what is happening now is that the railways which are expanding in the network between Europe and Asia, originally, even just a few years ago, there was a concern that most of the of flow is from China westward to Europe. That's the yellow line, the westbound. But now, in the last couple of years, we see that the eastbound flow has also increased. It has picked up, accelerated. You can see this when you speak with German companies, French companies, sales or exports of uh, refrigerated goods, foods, and other uh, wares and commodities are now increasingly flowing towards the Asian markets. And this two-way flow is just one indicator that we will see not just 1.6 trillion, we will very soon see 2 trillion, 2.5 trillion in trade across Eurasia. Another reason why European countries are so keen on expanding the Belt and Road Initiative and joining the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank is because here you can see that the largest engineering, procurement, construction firms in the world are European and Asian. And they see the opportunity to build these new silk roads together, to meet in the middle. And if you remember, it was in 2014 when uh, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank was announced at the time, President Obama and the United States did not want European countries to join this bank. But the Europeans did, very, very, very enthusiastically. And this is why, because they see the commercial, the business opportunity in bridging the divide between Europe and Asia. And so this, this is the most important map perhaps that I will show you today, shows you what the Belt and Road looks like. How will it unfold? Here you can see the major railway routes, oil pipelines, gas pipelines, electricity grids. There will be the digital Silk Road of fiber internet cables stretching along these corridors. All of these lines on this map will be built for a number of very, very secular reasons. The first is the population growth. 
There are countries on this map, post-colonial countries like Pakistan or India, obviously former Soviet republics as well. For the post-colonial countries in Asia, in Southeast Asia, in Southeast Asia, their populations have tripled since they gained independence from the British Empire. They have had very little or no new infrastructure. They all want to cope with their basic domestic needs and to be connected across borders to expand their trade. Now, moving from east to west is what so much of the focus is on when we talk about the Belt and Road. But in fact, it is also north to south as we see port cities that as they are developed, they want to build more railways into their interior regions, for example. Every country on this map is going to get more and more connected, even an island like Japan. I read some years ago that there was a very ambitious proposal to link Sakhalin to Japan, and then from southern Japan to link to Korea. Why not? In political geography or in natural geography, Japan is an island, but in functional geography, does it have to be? No, it does not have to be. China has proposed building a tunnel to Taiwan. You may have noticed that just last month, the world's longest bridge opened, connecting Hong Kong to Macau to Shuhai in the Pearl River Delta of southern China. We can use our capacity for engineering to overcome some of the most significant geographical obstacles. And we will continue to do that. And this is about fundamentally optimizing the distribution of people, of capital, of technology, of goods, of resources. It is, cannot be done without more infrastructure investment. To make this map, I traveled to every country that you see on it. I've spent a lot of time in the last 20 years in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan even, uh, you name it. All of these countries, and I asked the leaders, I asked the executives, what, are, what is the connectivity that you need for your economy, for your population? And this map is made from that. It is bottom up. It reflects the desires of all of your counterparts in all of these different countries that are your neighbors. And you can help them through your international partnerships and expansion to achieve that connectivity. These are the iron silk roads. And it is to emphasize not just, of course, about transportation, but also energy and communications. Infrastructure moves and evolves as a bundle of services. So the intermodal connectivity is extremely significant. Remember why China originally undertook this initiative. It has a lot to do with a very important historical principle in geopolitics, which we call the Malacca Trap, the Strait of Malacca, that is a very narrow maritime choke point running past between Singapore and Indonesia. And most of China's commodities inflow, most of its oil and gas imports, most of its exports of goods flow through that narrow channel in Singapore. They need and they sought resilience. How can we have overland ways to reduce that dependency on the maritime sector? How can we reach the core markets of Iran, the Arab countries, and Europe through and with Russia, Central Asia, and even Turkey? That was the ambition. And that will remain China's ambition for decades to come. The more connectivity we have, the more pathways we have for supply to meet demand. And that is a very, very wise investment. And as I said, it is about optimizing the distribution of resources, and that includes energy. By building new energy corridors, not just for oil and gas, hydrocarbon resources, 
but also for wind and solar power, as you see. There are very, very significant and necessary investments that are beginning in using the newest technologies in ultra high voltage electricity transmission to link the power supplies to the markets where they are needed most. Because as the Belt and Road develops, as these economies grow, more cities will form, more people will move to more cities, not only the mega cities, but also second tier cities. And they will have significant requirements, demands for transportation and for energy consumption. So many economists underestimate the demand for infrastructure. It is often criticized, particularly by Western economists, as being too expensive, and it should be simply driven by market forces. But what we have learned in the last 20 or 25 years is that you must invest in the capacity up front. It is supply-led growth. Supply creates demand, actually, when it comes to these fundamental infrastructures, whether it is hard infrastructures like the transportation sector, or whether it is things like housing, education, healthcare. And the two really do go hand in hand. Where we have high quality infrastructure, where we have good transportation and good logistics, that is where people want to be. It is a virtuous circle. So it is not true that we are, that we are investing too much. We are not yet investing nearly enough. And the proof is demand comes to meet the supply. Let me talk about a couple of very significant countries on the new Silk Roads that are so often thought of as frozen. For anyone who knows their history, we don't talk about the Silk Roads without talking about Iran. But in the last couple of decades, of course, we think of it as a frozen country. But if you go back 3,000 years, 2,000 years, 1,000 years, to almost any period of time other than the plague 600 years ago, Iran has been central, and it will be again. Already today, we see that they are trying to make investments, despite sanctions, to increase their energy production and output. And they are investing in the infrastructures, coastal and pipeline, that will help their energy reach markets. There are efforts that Russia, European governments are making together to find alternative mechanisms for transacting in energy investment, goods and services with Iran. In the long run, there is no question that Iran will return to the connected market that it has been, the society that it has been. Many people call it the last great emerging market. It's such a large population that is mostly urbanized, that is educated, that is a set of willing consumers. When I mentioned before, north-south as well as east-west, here, too, as Iranian ports develop, they will want more efficient railways moving northward through the Caucasus and to Russia as well. Then there is North Korea, where actually Russia as well has been a leader in trying to find ways to engage with North Korea rather than isolate. More isolated countries are more dangerous countries. That's actually the lesson of history. You don't solve the problem of regimes that are difficult by ignoring them and by isolating them. You only solve it by engaging with them. I remember when President Putin traveled to Seoul, South Korea, in 2014. He said, I want to see an iron silk road to Seoul. Of course, you cannot get there from Vladivostok to Seoul without going through Pyongyang. And what is happening now, especially due to the diplomacy, the elections in South Korea earlier this, from last year to this year, the summit that took place in Singapore between President Trump and Kim Jong-un, we see now the momentum that is developing to integrate another frontier market into this greater Silk Road orbit. And it is being done through these plans for railways, that Russia and China and South Korea can cooperate on together. 
and industrial corridors to utilize the, wealth, the, the natural resources, the wealth of the North Korean economy and connect those to the world. Here too, railways will play a very significant role. Now, there is in many people's minds a competition between the different modes of transportation and logistics. For example, maritime. The Indian Ocean has replaced the Atlantic Ocean as the primary body of water as the conduit for global goods trade. Most of the world shipping now is across the Indian Ocean. And most goods are still transported by maritime vessels. But as I said, when you look at this sector, you can see how it benefits you. Because every time a new port project is developed, whether it is from Greece to Iran, the Dukum port of Oman to Indian ports, as well as the many new ports being planned in Southeast Asia, all of those must be connected by rail. And that is where you can already assess. By looking at this competitive sector, you can actually see where your future demand is going to be as well. And I view this as an example of how we have to view intermodal transportation as a priority. The same goes for aviation. The billions of people who live in this greater Asian geography that now represent the majority of the world's middle class are traveling, moving, tourists, business travelers more than ever before. All of the world's busiest international airline routes are between Asian countries. All of them. It is mostly within the Gulf region or within East Asia, but increasingly you have longer routes that are connecting uh, the, across, across the, the vast spread in the expanse of Asia. So it's important to put it all together into one image where you can see the airlines, the railways, the maritime corridors, the roads, all coming together. And you can see something very, very important here. Not only are Asians getting more connected to each other, but the story is not just about China and China's ambitions and China's plans. The story is about how the more of this connectivity that we build, the more other centers of growth emerge. If you look at the populations of South Asia, from Pakistan through India and Bangladesh, through Southeast Asia, from Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, that is 2.5 billion people. That is larger, of course, than the population of China. And every one of those countries is younger than China in terms of its median age. All of them are fast-growing economies today. If those 2.5 billion people grow at half, only half the rate that China has been growing, they will reach the GDP of China in exactly 10 years. So think about the potential of the region as a whole, not only what China has kicked off and what China represents, because Asia together is 5 billion people. And that is crucial. You are building for the future, and the future is not just China, it is all of the other Asian centers of growth as well. And you must be connected to all of them. You can see here that in GDP terms, based on purchasing power parity, Asia is already a multipolar region. And it clearly represents the largest economic zone in the world. And of course, as I said at the beginning, Europe and Asia together represent the majority of the world's economy. And all of those sub-regions are now growing more and more together. The rate of trade integration across the regions of Asia is much faster than the overall rate 
of trade growth in the world economy. And that is why countries like Russia, Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, countries that have historically thought of themselves as leaning more, trading more, diplomatically being oriented more towards Europe, towards the West are saying, wait, let us have more balance. Let us focus as much or more on our opportunities to the East as to the West. And you can see this in the numbers, not only in trade, but in investment. The Russia Direct Investment Fund takes very significant investment from the sovereign wealth funds of the Gulf region, for example. There is an Asianization of capital markets, a foreign investment, of supply chain linkages, all of these are accelerating. And that shows that there is a system, an economic system that underpins all of this. And in that greater system, China is only one third of the population, one half of the GDP, one half of the outbound capital, and one half of the inward capital of the region. That's today. Now, because of the trade wars and trade tensions today, you can see that the trends that I am describing are accelerating because many companies are diverting their investments from China to Vietnam, to Thailand, to India, to other countries in the region. And therefore, all of those countries will now grow even faster. People in the media are talking about the US-China situation as if there is no winner. That's not true. There is always a winner from a conflict. And it's usually a group that does not participate in the conflict at all. And in this case, that is most definitely South Asia and Southeast Asia. And both of those regions represent growing trade partners of yours, in fact. So let me bring it back to transportation. I like this comic. You've all heard of Hyperloop. It represents the kind of ambition that we like to see in the corporate world and the application of technology and engineering. So someone took the London tube map, the underground map, and said, let's map it on to the whole world. Let us aspire to a global transportation system that connects all the major cities of the world together uh, by rail in this way. And this is one rendition of what it might look like. But more seriously, I want to conclude where I began. I took you back through history to show you how for thousands of years we have consistently, irreversibly been building more and more connectivity and how we have been urbanizing very rapidly. And I said we have to bring the two of those together. We are headed towards a world which, in which every city is connected seamlessly to every other city. Because that is how cities think. Cities want to be connected. You cannot measure the economy of a major city without taking into account the role that trade, investment, talent, flows of people play in that economy. So every one of the major cities I showed you in the first map wants to be connected to all of the others by airlines, by railways, by internet cables, they want their stock exchanges to have seamless listings of equities. All of those things are happening. And I call that the Pax Urbanica. In Latin, that would mean the peace among cities. Because as I said before, we are moving into a new paradigm of geopolitics, where power and influence are not determined only by size, but by the degree of connectivity. In a country like Russia, that has a special place in the world, is the largest country, also needs to think about its future in terms of how connected its cities are. And the more connected your cities are to each other within your country, the more prosperous your economy will be. The more connected each of your cities is internationally, the more your trade will expand, the more you will benefit from the next wave of global economic growth. This is a peaceful vision of the world. And the reason is because in the long run, in fact, connectivity does promote peace. It doesn't do so on purpose. It actually does so by accident. 
because the more pathways you build for connectivity, for supply to meet demand, the more options there are for oil and gas, for, for, for people, for goods, for services, to move to where they need to be. It cannot be, you cannot block the flow anymore. So the more connectivity we build, the more options we build, the more resilience we build into the system. And that prevents conflicts from escalating to a global scale. And if we can keep that stability for now, that will allow the mission of connectivity to continue. So I hope that that inspires you a little bit further in your very, very ambitious mission. It's only been 15 years, but I hope that you will think 15 or 30 years more into the future, because that is how long it will take, at a minimum, to achieve this vision of a connected world, one in which Russia has a truly central place. Thank you so much. Спасибо. Thank you.